the mini courses uh, for this uh, for the boot camp. Um, and so she'll give the first part today and the last two parts tomorrow. And we'll also in the morning have a talk from Deirdre Mulligan if she makes it. I actually got an email from her saying there's some complications on her. She's like on the other side of the country right now. But anyway, hopefully it'll be good. Uh, so uh, Katrina is also one of the organizers. And she's going to be talking about a bunch of different things, um, many of which are related to kind of one of the reading groups we'd like to run. Uh, this semester, so she'll also talk about that. Great, yeah. So uh, this first portion of the talk for today is reasonably separate from the two portions tomorrow. Uh, today I'll be talking about this data co-ops idea, um, which is work with Kobe. And then tomorrow I'll be doing a sort of more general talk on various themes from economics and game theory uh, that relate to the study of privacy. And there, there will be plenty of connections. And in particular, I, I'll sort of extract out all of the uh, game theory and economics questions that should have been in today's talk and save them for tomorrow uh, for you. There wouldn't have been time anyway. OK, so the, this is really a collection of preliminary thoughts, as Adam alluded to. Um, Kobe and I are planning on writing a working group around this theme over the course of the semester. Um, so hopefully this is the beginning of a conversation with many of you and the source of a lot of questions and ideas. So the sort of starting point for this discussion is this world that we live in, um, one in which I, personal data are so incredibly central to advertising and to sales, strategic decision making, that the companies that are managing to access our data, to collect it, store it, make sense of it, have turned it into the world's most valuable resource. So a 2017 Economist article, and there have been other quotes that I've seen have, that have alluded to this, has argued that data has replaced oil as the world's most valuable resource. This is the world we live in. And given that, it's not so surprising that this amazing, rich landscape has arisen around monetizing data. And there's been a lot of creative innovation in this space. People are doing really amazing things and solving really, really interesting problems using personal data. There's a lot of fun stuff going on there. One thing that we've noticed in recent years is that there's also a lot of concern in this space. And there have been a number of efforts, and I'll show you a few of them, trying to respond to various concerns around uses of personal data. Uh, so for some of them are for profits, like this startup um, that I try to help you get back some control of your personal data, perhaps in exchange for something. Um, in this particular case, this is, there's an opportunity for users to exchange their data for special offers from brands. Um, there, here's another example, a nonprofit cooperative um, that focuses on health data, sort of forming a data repository um, so people can donate their data uh, to a project like this, make it more accessible to researchers. Um, another effort we've seen, um, this is uh, an effort that started as an academic one and has now become a nonprofit organization, um, sort of an ecosystem of small organizations focused on this idea of letting people take their data out of sort of the central repositories um, and move them to what they call them, sort of microservers, uh, providing high security and some increased degree of control over your personal data. Other efforts sort of with similar themes coming up in lots of places. Um, here's another one, um, again, I, with this idea that maybe data shouldn't be tied to the application, maybe data shouldn't be held or sort of I managed by the companies that are using our data. Perhaps we should be returning data to people. Um, and then there are sort of more, less technical, more sort of political uh, responses to the current landscape. Uh, so the Data Union is a nonprofit uh, with, a, with a vision of sort of 
giving people some sort of collective voice to negotiate with the big names who are using our data. So lots of efforts in this space responding to lots of different concerns. Um, so I'd like to try to identify some of the concerns that these projects have been responding to. And what is the sort of overarching feeling that the internet that we have is not the internet that we were promised? I, that somehow the internet started out as this, this venue for giving control to the people. Um, and there was this sense of excitement and empowerment and individual uh, control. And that somehow now we've, we live in this world with a handful of dominant platforms. And many people view this as problematic for a number of reasons. And one of them is that a handful of platforms is a few potential massive points of failure. And that's failure in lots of different senses. Uh, failure in sort of the obvious senses of security, vulnerabilities, and hacks, but also failure in terms of incentives. Uh, if, I mean, if one of these companies has incentives to do something that we're not so happy with as a society, that can have a huge impact on society. Uh, so we're, there, there are a lot of concerns about the inter internet that we that we have today. And some of the, the startups that I mentioned and efforts in this space focus on missed opportunities for innovation in today's ecosystem. So what do I mean by this? Well, you know, I said there's so much data out there, so much being collected, it's so exciting, there's so much you can do with it. But actually, it's not so clear if you are a researcher or a small startup that you can really get your hands on the data that you need in this current ecosystem. So say you're a small startup and you're interested in linking two different types of data that don't generally show up in the same database. Like you want to understand purchasing habits and mental health information and link those together because you have a really great idea that's going to help people. How do you do it? Say you want to get at some really, really specific subpopulation. You have a great product that's going to help people who are in a very particular situation. You have a creative idea. How do you reach those people in today's ecosystem you're, if you're not one of the big players in the space? Say you want to deliver a highly tailored experience to your users that might depend on a lot of personal information. But you don't want to get in the business of actually having and gathering all of that personal information. How do you go about that in today's ecosystem? So actually, there are a lot of challenges, particularly if you're not one of the big players, but even if you're one of the big players, in getting access to the data that you might want. And there's also this question that maybe the, the, ac the access isn't just the only problem. Maybe the data that you want isn't being collected in the first place, because there are a lot of barriers to the collection of high quality production and collection and production of high quality data. So we saw a lot of these themes already in Falco's talk, but so, you know, sometimes there's no existing market for the data, so why would anybody be, be gathering it? We live in a world where quality data isn't really compensated, so why would high quality data be, be gathered? And of course, there's so many risks to holding data that many companies and many researchers are very, very nervous about doing it. You open yourself up to breaches, to subpoenas, to GDPR violations. And so actually, this rich and amazing landscape is not necessarily a landscape that gets the best data into the right hands. And then, of course, we saw a lot of those efforts that I mentioned earlier on responding to individuals' concerns about the current data landscape. Issues like, I don't actually really know who gets access to my data and for what purpose. I don't know what I'm trading for what. I mean, I have the sense that I go online and I'm trading my data for something, but I don't really have a very good sense of what that trade-off is. And the potential consequences of that trade-off are far from transparent to me as a user. And sometimes you just start to get the sense that everybody's making money off of your data, except for you. So a lot of people are unhappy with the status quo and trying to figure out things to do about this. And 
you know, some illustration of what passes for individual control and autonomy in the, in the current landscape is this fantastic website provided by Axicom, one of the big data brokers. Um, they offer you to, you know, this opportunity to demystify the data sphere and return control to your hands, which is basically an opportunity for you to go in and correct the information they have about you so they know more about you. <laughs> uh, and we, we live in this world where uh, you know, reading the privacy policies you encounter in a year would take you 76 work days. And of course, this is from some new number of years ago, so forget it. You've, you're going to take all year at this. Uh, so what can we do? So as I mentioned, there are a lot of ideas out there, and more every day. So Kobe and I get together some students gathered something like 30 different uh, startups and academic efforts that are in this space, and I'm, every day I hear about more of them. Um, and they tend to fall around a number of themes. There are a bunch of efforts around the theme of trying to help people monetize their personal data, try to rectify the sense that everybody else is making money and, hey, shouldn't I get a piece of that? There are a lot of efforts trying to make more and better data available for research. There are a number of efforts that are around themes of restoring individual control and trying to get data sort of back into individuals' hands in various ways. Um, I mentioned a couple of these already. One that stands out in this list, sort of because it's a little bit of a slightly different flavor and an interesting story, is this data as labor movement. Um, there, there's been work, sort of both academic and outside of the academic community, advocating for the protection and recognition of data actually as a form of labor. And if you think of data as work, that has all sorts of consequences, legal and otherwise. And some of them align very, in, in very interesting ways um, with some of these other concerns that I talked about. So this whole set of concerns and efforts, uh, to me, looks like an opportunity. So there's a real opportunity here to sit back a bit and think about how can we formalize the problem? Um, and how can we organize the concerns? And what can be done in this space? And so that's a lot of what I'm trying to do with this talk. So Kobe and I together have identified what we view as sort of three essential pillars of any solution to take on these myriad problems in this uh, data landscape. Um, and so one of the things I'll do is talk about those a bit more today. But the three for us are creation of value. So what do I mean by that? So whatever the solution is, it's going to have to take people's personal data and to transform it into something that has more value than we were getting as a society before. We have to think about meaningful individual control. So whatever solution this is going to be has to be giving real people choices that they can actually make and handle that, that give them sort of the opportunity to understand what's going on with their data and to, to make some choices about it. And we have to think in a really, really serious way about security and privacy. And so those, those are sort of, for us, the three things that are going to be essential to any solution here. We we'll talk a little bit about what, what each of those means and, and why we think they're so important. So what am I trying to do here? This is a very strange talk, right? I didn't come here to tell you about work that's already been done. I didn't really come here to, to give you a survey about anything. So, so what I'm really trying to do here is to start a discussion, as I mentioned before. So I want to think about, we're going somewhere. We are somewhere as a society. What are the alternative paths forward? Let's reckon with where we're going right now and think about whether or not that's what we want. And what are the other possibilities? And then what we'd really like to do is to build a research community broadly around what we're going to call this data co-op idea, which we'll get to in a minute, um, and understand the research challenges in building a solution in this space. Um, and what we'd like to do is really come up with any of you who are interested with lots of ideas and tools that could potentially serve lots of different initiatives that share some of the goals that I've described so far. Um, so as part of this, we really need to understand what, what should the principles and ground rules of work in this space be? What are the goals for work in this space? Um, and I want to emphasize throughout that we're not looking to commit to a single model, to a single solution. We don't want to, this semester, build the answer and you know, convert society over to another model. 
we want to explore the space and we want to build the tools that let people explore in this space. So I want to talk uh, a bit more about what Kobe and I have identified as sort of the, the key uh, pillars of a solution and what that might look like and try to make this a little bit more concrete for us all to have something to talk about. Um, and then to think about sort of what are the, the implications uh, of, of really changing the model by which we hold and transact on data. And then to talk a little bit, but this is where you all hopefully come in, about the research agendas that are raised by a complete rethinking of how we transact and hold on data. So, so how might a co-op provide value control and security? So what do we mean when I say a data co-op? So here's one vision of what a data co-op could look like. So the idea is, instead of the current model where companies come along and collect your data sort of as part of your interaction with them and then do who knows what with it, I, individuals could opt to join a data cooperative and they could opt to funnel some or all of their personal data through the co-op. And the co-op would act on their behalf in any negotiation involving someone, some entity, who would like to use their data. And so all of these companies that are interested in using my data here, they need to negotiate with my co-op in order to do so. Uh, potentially they compensate the co-op for access to various data products that the co-op provides. Some of that compensation potentially flows back to me as an individual. But the idea is that I as an individual can express my preferences to the co-op in some way and then I can entrust the co-op to act on my behalf. And so to, this makes it a little bit more concrete. And so then in sort of against this context, we can talk again about those three pillars. So what could a co-op do here? So a co-op could create value for society in a number of ways. So the co-op immediately can create data products that just you can't dream of in today's ecosystem. Because the co-op potentially is bringing together huge amounts of data of different types that currently would never dream of lying in the same database, uh, is potentially bringing together data that you know, currently isn't even gathered much higher quality data than is currently being gathered, and then has the ability to market all sorts of sophisticated data products. And this is all being done with people's consent, meaningfully expressed, um, and permission. And so you get yourself out of a lot of trouble um, that you might otherwise be in trying to create these interesting data products. From the perspective of somebody who wants to use data, the co-op's also providing value uh, because the co-op could potentially, in addition to providing these amazing new data products, be actually providing data science tools. So maybe you don't want to have an in-house privacy expert or an in-house data science expert, an in-house you know, group of statisticians. You don't want to have to think about privacy regulations in various jurisdictions. The co-op can take care of all of that. You say, this is what I need from this population, the co-op can provide. And it could potentially really, by centralizing some aspects of this market, uh, eliminate a number of existing sort of frictions and inefficiencies. So the second pillar that we mentioned was control. So how can the co-op enable personal control of data? So one thing that is really important here is that we envision most people not really wanting to think about the nitty gritty of where their data is going and for what purpose on, you know, at this very moment and exactly which sources are be being combined and exactly what compensation they're getting. Most people want to fix it and forget its solution when it comes to thinking about uh, their personal data. And the co-op could potentially provide that by providing delegated decision making. You come to the co-op and you adopt a data preferences profile, maybe one of a handful recommended by various outside experts. You click, this is how I want my data to be handled. And then the co-op takes care of it for you. And so that delegated decision making where the co-op can act on your behalf potentially really gives you a lot more control than systems where you are expected to be the one to read and to click and to decide. Um, the goal would be to provide, of course, individuals with a variety of meaningful understandable choices. I realize that those are very difficult things to achieve, to control uh, how data are being used and by whom, for what purpose. Um, the co-op should allow people to change their choices, to revoke them, to revise them, to update them, 
And the co-op should continually provide to individuals an update of how their data are being used and the risks that they might be taking on. So the co-op is really providing you with an amazing amount of control and transparency, potentially. And then the third thing, the pillar that we had up there was security and privacy. Um, so really, not surprisingly, given the context of, of this particular discussion, uh, privacy is near and dear to our hearts. Um, and it's absolutely essential that as part of this, you're giving individuals access to meaningful trade-offs between data use and risks and the benefits. And, and so it's really important that as much as possible, we think concretely and rigorously about the risks of data uses, that we measure them, that we track them, that we help people understand them, that we help people control them. Um, and absolutely, one of the, the advantages of the co-op is that collectively it could help people advocate for better privacy protections, for better security protections. And it, the co-op could actually be an active uh, protector of members in the sense of vigilantly auditing for unauthorized uses of data, advocating for members' rights, potentially even in political arenas, um, and pursuing legal action. So the co-op can be a combination of solutions, not just a legal solution, not just a technical solution, but a hybrid of sort of all the tools that we have at our disposal to help protect people and advocate for their rights. So I view these as sort of the, the things that are really essential uh, to helping us build a tool that can address the concerns in this data space. Um, I want to try to make it even a little bit more concrete by going through a couple of questions that might be in the back of your mind right now. So I'm talking about this co-op thing. What, what are the types of data that could potentially be held by a co-op? And the answer is kind of a non-answer in the sense that it could be anything and everything that's currently being gathered about you and many things that you haven't even dreamed that could be gathered about you. The idea, though, would be that you as an individual would, con contain would continually have control and choice in this space. Co-ops could potentially choose to focus, some of them, on particular data domains. You might see medical data co-ops emerge as a specific uh, area. Or maybe you see co-ops really making benefits getting benefit from the idea of really bringing together very disparate types of data. Um, but you should think of this as potentially a very, very broad collection of types of data. Another natural question is, OK, so this model is really foreign and very different from how we currently work with data. How does this fit with the existing model? What would happen to the data that companies already have about me? And the immediate answer is, again, sort of a, a non-answer in the sense that, well, nothing would immediately happen to the data that's already held by you. That's, that's out there. I can't change that. Um, and companies that are, could continue to operate in their current model alongside an emerging co-op model. Now, it is possible that if the co-op model were to gain traction, that might put pressure on organizations that have sort of the traditional models of, of data collection and usage to change some of their practices. But the, this is something that could potentially really coexist um, with the existing model. And so similarly, what would happen to your current free services where you're exchanging data for something? The answer is, well, that could continue to exist alongside services that would evolve to negotiate directly with a co-op and be a little bit more transparent about the trade-offs that they're offering. And I imagine that if co-ops were successful, that the trade-offs that companies would offer would change with time. Um, and then I think the other big thing that I imagine might be in your mind at this point is who's buying what from the co-op? Um, what is it exactly that the co-op is going to sell? Is this co-op going to sell my browsing history to a, to a company? Are they going to sell my medical records to a company? And the answer is, well, I guess they could, but probably not. Because that's probably not what these companies really need. What they really need, mostly, are things like aggregate statistics, trends, correlations, ability to target. But they don't actually necessarily really need access to your data in order to target. Um, the answer is, though, it's open for discussion. And this is one of the interesting questions, is what are the kinds of things that a co-op might market, and how should you price things like that? 
Okay. So hopefully this gives you some sense of, of what we're, we're proposing in this, to sort of explore in this place. Why yeah. would I want to convert to give my data? Why would you want to give your data to a co-op? Yeah. So as in, from the individual's perspective, um, hopefully the co-op would offer you a number of protections that you couldn't achieve as an individual going al it alone. I don't really have the ability to go around to all the companies who I currently interact with and say, hey, I'm going to stop interacting with you unless you give me better privacy protections. They're going to say, good luck to you. If you work with a group of people uh, to negotiate for better security, for better privacy, for more transparency, you have a hope of negotiating. You also, when you join a group of people, you increase the value of your data. And formally, we can talk about the value of data is more than the sum of its parts. And so when you come together with other people, you actually can get a financial benefit um, in addition to this negotiating power. Um, so the hope would, that would be that you would be getting lots of benefits in exchange for being a member of the co-op. There is a concern, of course, how do you get something like this started? Because initially, there probably wouldn't be such great benefits. Speaking of getting this started, would you mind going back to the slide with the different companies that use um, like Miko and Mi? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, so I I've been following the, the birth of these a little bit. Great. And, and, but I have never looked in detail on sort of their model. But I was wondering, in your the full survey of them, and when, when you and Kobe develop the, the data, what, what does the data co-op do that these models don't, right? I mean, so, so where's the gap? Because yeah. I, mean, I feel like a lot of different angles are, are covered by many things. things. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. How, how is what, what you, 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 your vision different there? I didn't quite get that. So one thing is that I have yet to see another effort that gets privacy right. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, that's sort of a universal. Um, many of these efforts are missing the sort of collective aspect where you create value by bringing together many people's data and the collective aspect where you create an organization that can negotiate. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of the efforts that are in the right direction on security or privacy are also very distributed and individualistic. And they're missing this collective action aspect of things. Um, I mean, some of these are for-profit efforts with very dubious um, benefits to, to the individuals and very dubious business models in some cases. Um, so it's, I have yet to see all of these in place, um, but it may be that I've missed something. And I would actually love to see somebody saying, look, here are three efforts that actually have more commonalities than you've realized with data co-ops. Because that would allow us to think about tools that could serve all of these efforts at once. Um, and actually, I'll talk about this more later. But I, I think it would be great to see diversity in the space of ideas and in implementations. And so if you've done some survey in this space, I'd love to hear about you know, what you're aware of and the efforts that we should know about. Yeah, other questions at this point? Yeah. Um, are you familiar with Dan Wiles book? I mean, this is. Yes. Yeah, so I was alluding to, to him when I, when I talked about data as labor. Um, and yeah, I've talked with him, and Rachel's talked closely with him about related ideas in the space. Um, and what we're advocating for is very, very well aligned in many regards. We have slightly different uh, priorities and perspectives and motivations. Um, but it was very rewarding to, to realize that Coming with those different perspectives and motivations, we've come to very similar per perspectives on the problem in many ways. Right, and, and so the demo is going to be in the details. So even what Helen, can you just say what was the book that? Yeah, you so so I, yeah, so there there's this uh, book of Glenn Weil and Eric Posner called Radical Markets. Uh, one of the chapters in this book is on data as labor specifically. Um, each of the chapters sort of. You know, proposes a radical idea for sort of changing how we do something economic in the world, and, and this is one of the chapters there. So, so I mean, the, and he has his very, you know, he has this economic approach to it where he, where I think correctly is saying that some of the attempts, I mean, even we made 
a, no a number of years ago, uh, Dan Bonet and Alvin Nara, a bunch of us had created this thing called Agnostic, where we said, you know, you shouldn't track us, we'll track ourselves, and then we'll do some processing, blah, blah, blah. Well, like, coming in as an individual, just forget about it. Right. So, so this idea of, of um, creating larger negotiating pools really makes sense. But then, you, you have a question of what is the principle according to which you create co-op. And when I say the devil is in the detail, it seems to me that what you've presented so far, um, if you take some of the constraints, some of them are actually incompatible with one another. And it may be that um, what you're saying is let the co-ops flower, which is great. Maybe they're like unions. If, if they're like unions and you become um, a member, then, and I think this is a little bit with Wilde's ideas that, you, you know, the co-op says, look at what we're doing, and then if you join us, you're subscribed under those. So when you talk about individual control, it's not like you go to the co-op as an agent and say, this is what I want, make sure you get it. So like, they're different models. And by the way, the idea of being targeted but not um, revealed data, that's what sinking out is. So it might still run afoul of certain kinds of privacy constraints. So I, I mean, I, I'm not dinging the principle of this intermediary who is who, who ca that carries certain of the principles that the theory of privacy might want. I'm just suggesting that when you lay out the constraints, you might then need to create rather radically different kinds of, I'm not even sure that COP is necessarily the right terminology for it. Great, yeah, so lots of good points in there. Let me just draw on a couple of them, but I think we'll need to return to them over the course of days and weeks and years. Uh, so, so one of the uh, potential tensions between the sort of pillars of the solution, uh, this is something I'd love to continue the conversation about. I, th I th think that that's something that requires more, more detail, but it, I mean, if particular tensions that come to mind, please note them and we'll continue the conversation on that. Um, on the idea that I, the individual control might be something you have to cede. I actually disagree with you on that. I, I think that um, the the co-op, well, it's certainly true that a co-op will need to make decisions on behalf of the group. The, the co-op will need to, for example, prioritize how to spend the revenue it gets from, uh, from uh, selling data products. And so this is not something where you are necessarily going to get what you want and I'm going to get what I want if what I want is to spend the revenue on advocacy and you want to spend the revenue on putting that money in your pocket. Uh, so we, we may not both get what we want and there will need to be some form of governance and there will need to be some form of decision making and there may need to be multiple co-ops that have different guiding principles and you may subscribe to one and I may subscribe to another. But I think within each co-op, there should be the ability for different individuals to have different priorities in the sense of I might decide that I'm not just, I'm not gonna let anybody touch my medical data. And you might decide that you want all of your medical data to go directly into the hands of any researcher who requests it. And the co-ops ought to have some ability for us to express these very different preferences about data usage. Lots of really good things in your point. I think we have to hold the rest of them and continue on, but thank you. Keep noting them down, and I want to come back to them all. Maybe one more thing to note is that we're not advocating for a specific uh, setting, a specific solution for those. We are observing that things happen now in the world, and we believe that bringing our technical understanding and our ability to uh, 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 abstract, generalize, formalize these problems uh, can be very crucial in making tools for these projects to do things right. So it may be, and Katrina already mentioned that we're not advocating like a one uh, co -op solution, and, and I think you put that into the research agenda, and, and it's like man, there are tons of very interesting uh, questions that are many of which do fall within like the, the, the research in, interest of many people in, in, in this group and, and why we thought it, it would be interesting to present. Yes. Okay, so let me skip ahead a bit to back where we were. 
Um, so we, we talked about the concrete questions. Let's talk briefly about sort of what the, this future might look like, um, and then I want to get into the research agendas a bit. So, so a number of things might change in a future with some version of data co-ops. Um, we might see some existing things that get done with data done in slightly different ways with very different guarantees to individuals. We might see totally new applications emerge to take advantage of new opportunities in data. And we'd see sort of a new player, the, this co-op, emerge in the data arena. And there are some implications to that. So I think it's worth doing a little bit of thinking about sort of what might change about existing applications, existing uses of personal data. Um, and sort of the thing to keep in mind is that changes might actually be fairly gradual. Uh, an initial co-op of some sort might actually primar primarily provide legal protections and advocacy and awareness rather than technical solutions. Um, and this is something that might change with time um, as the co-op matures the, the set of technical tools available. But it, initially it might be, let's all agree that we're only going to you know, give our data to such and such a company if they agree to give us a more reasonable, more understandable contract. That could be an initial action of a co-op. Yes, you look disturbed by this. No, I'm not. <laughs> anything, sorry to say, I'm a little skeptic, and I don't want to be skeptic because I think it's a great idea. Um, but it, it, like the moment you said data is labor, it just struck me like that we are very much in a situation where we don't have control of our data, much like people did not have control of the fruits of their labor back when the industrial revolution started. But what was the solution? The solution was strike. And it just doesn't strike me as strike is being feasible right now, right? Because like this thing, if you were to design me a, a, a computer like this, then I would trust you for all the security reasons, but I, I'm not going to trust you that it's going to work correctly. Sorry, Katrina. I know you're going to Thank you. Yeah, so, so I, I, I think I see what you mean um, about a strike. I mean, there are those who actually advocate that that's the way forward. I share some of your skepticism about that. Um, yeah, let's, let's hold the discussion of launch strategies, but I think that is one of the critical research questions that needs to be explored, is how could you get something like this off the ground? And how, because hopefully I can convince you that sort of at equilibrium something like this could work. I think the really tricky thing is how do you get there? Um, so let's return to that theme, time permitting, at least. Over the course of the semester, let's return to that theme. Um, so you have to think a little bit in order to think about existing applications and what might change in this new world. Uh, what a value is currently being exchanged? Who's giving what to whom? Um, and what are the opportunities of changing the model is that you can unshackle yourself from this idea that you have to pay with data, that it's the only currency that you have in most of these interactions. Uh, a useful question is to think about for applications, does personal data actually need to be transmitted in order to achieve the goals of whatever this application is? So for example, for thinking about email, how might that change in a data co-op world? Well, maybe the co-op would help provide you know, sort of incentives, infrastructure, encouragement in directions of security, encryption. Maybe there would be ideas of mixing networks. Um, maybe you could give stronger guarantees for data that stays within the co-op. So if I email somebody within my co-op, maybe I get stronger promises than if the data needs to leave the co-op. Um, and you could rethink how you pay for services like this. Another question you might ask is, does the service actually need to learn from aggregate user data? Is the sort of the current exchange one where basically their goal is to learn trends, correlations, things like this? So things where you see this are, uh, for example, recommendation systems or navigation software. And then you can think about, well, how can you redo this so that you know, Waze doesn't actually need to know where I am? Um, and pe there are people thinking about actually questions along these lines. Um, so the, learn the process of doing the learning on, on people's data could actually potentially happen inside the co-op. Um, so the company could send the co-op their algorithm. It could be trained. Um, it, on co-op data. The co-op could then act as a proxy for delivery of information, for delivery of goods, for delivery of payments. Recommendations would get much better because they'd be based on much more data, potentially. Um, and so 
the, you know, the new Amazon would actually know exactly what you want to buy. Um, and this, you potentially, though, have strict controls on the privacy risk from the tailoring of recommendations. The other question that's useful is, I, is, it some, is this company doing something that really probably can't immediately move inside the co-op, for example, because of extraordinary computational requirements? A good example here is web search. That's probably not going to all happen inside the co-op. Um, so how can we control the information that needs to leave the co-op in order to achieve the goals? Um, so you might think about stripping queries of unnecessary identifying information, bundling to them together, somehow acting as a proxy for payment. So there's a lot of thinking to be done about what are the limits of what we can do depending on what hap needs to happen where and what are the services being provided. Co-ops, though, as I mentioned before, could potentially enable totally new applications that you just can't, you can't do right now. Uh, you could potentially be you know, nano-targeting ads without invading people's privacy, um, because as we talked about before, companies can sort of achieve all of their data needs in one place. I, one interesting thing that, that co-ops help a lot with, potentially, is secondary uses. So what do I mean by this? Um, in the current data ecosystem, it's really, really basically impossible to go back to somebody a couple years later and say, oh, I want to know one more thing about you. You know, I, you were in my survey three years ago, but I also need to know this. Um, and so in order to make up for this difficulty of getting back to people, when you collect data, the thing to do is just collect anything you could ever dream of needing in the future and get people to agree to arbitrary uses of it. Because then, when you realize, three years down the line, that I actually need this for this other purpose, you have it. Obviously, this is problematic from the pr perspective of individual control and transparency. But data co-ops can potentially solve this problem, because you realize you need a little bit more data from that specific person, you go back to the co-op. You need a little bit more information about this particular po population, you go back to the co-op. It's very obvious where you go, what the source is, what the procedure is. And people already have their agreements in place, so it's a matter of a click. You don't have to go and track them down and ask them questions and have them sign new forms. Data linkage, we sometimes think of it as an evil in the privacy world, but it's obviously you know, a huge opportunity. And we saw this in, in Falco's talk. Amazing things you can potentially do if you can bring together disparate sources. So there are huge opportunities here. And as I mentioned before, if you have sort of a, a niche idea with a small target audience, much more feasible um, in, this, in this imaginary world. And the co-op, as I mentioned, is also taking on additional roles that aren't currently served in the data ecosystem. A consumer protection role, poten potentially helping serve some of the, the purposes that the Danny alluded to earlier, um, protecting political discourse, protecting our democracy, um, letting consumers have an, a way to vote with their feet. Currently, in, there's this sort of sense of data lock-in with a lot of applications. Um, you don't really have a choice to pick up your data and go somewhere else. And that might be more feasible in a co-op model. And that might provide more competition, better choices for people. Um, better protections, higher standards for the algorithms that you get used on our data, and the ability to sort of have our voice be heard. Uh, what are our priorities? for what should be protected, what should be guaranteed, um, what should be prioritized in terms of who should have access to data, and what should be done with data. Um, sorry, I, I just, I want to hear what the purpose of the co-op idea is in the first place. You know, some of the, I, I love the goals that you're laying out, <coughs> the innovation, um, letting consumers vote for their feet, with their feet, Public interest, democracy, all of those things. But I can't argue with dark and democracy. <laughs> um, but I still don't. I, we're, you know, all of us have been saying in the current model, even like um, let people compete on the basis of privacy. Uh, what are all these people doing? Because now you know the democracy snafus and all of that. So, what is it about the co-op idea? And what I'm worried about is that underneath the hood, and maybe 
you keep saying about individual control, but if you think that there's some societal benefit, which obviously you can see with where this is coming from, I'm not sure how you're going to squeeze out that more out of the carp idea without the kind of heavy-handed regulation that many of us are waiting to happen in the current model. So I want to hear a little bit about what value the carp is bringing that will assure all of these things that's going to be just as hard to secure Plus, give us the societal value that I think privacy needs to give. It's not just about individual control. Yeah. Great. I. It's a research agenda. Um, one piece. One piece of a possible answer is that the the co-op's creating a new political entity, um, and that's potentially a powerful entity that. I don't know that there's a way forward that doesn't involve reg regulatory intervention at some point, um, but maybe can enact some of the things that you might be hoping to do with regulatory intervention, may be able to do that in, a, in another way. But it, it's a research question, absolutely, yeah. But, but, but I, some of the optimism is in the change potential change in balance, like as Katrina mentioned, if you are trying to negotiate with big companies, you're about to fail. Maybe bringing in, uh, um, you know, if it's strong in, in negotiation power, I can uh, change that, that balance. I think a lot of the currently, uh, like the things that the people are trying to do today, are trying to get into this thing of like changing that that balance. I think I think that sorry, but I think that this this is like a critical question because the way we have things today, if I'm in legal trouble and I'm rich, I can hire myself a really expensive and excellent lawyer. Mm -hmm. But if I'm poor, then I'm going to wind up with, you know, state-sponsored defense, which, mm -hmm. is, which is not very good. So, I'm, again, it's not like to ding it. It's to say that certain, um, they need, for this co-op idea to be anything different and not just be, well, the rich people have powerful co-ops that can get highest prices for the data of those rich people who joined that expensive like sports club or you know mm -hmm. but you then need to have some principles of like what is this whole model trying to achieve in society that is different from what we have today and will achieve it but without some of the like when we look at other agents in society what we get is the rich get the good ones Etc. And and we have, I think, we're in a kind of failure mode. If that's what we're trying to do with this particular idea. Failure in modes is the next slide. Yes, and absolutely, there's a there's a real concern of, of, of a future society with data haves and data have nots, and I mean, there's a whole space of really big questions to talk about there. Yeah. So I'd love I'd love to continue to talk about those. Yeah. Maybe you'll get this in when it comes when you get to failure modes. There's also this issue that you're creating a single major single point of single point of failure or small All right. yes that is the next slide um, I don't have a solution to this problem but it's a huge problem and basically the the theme for the the you know all continuing discussion is you should think as much as you possibly can about all the ways that this can go wrong and all of us should do, dedicate a huge amount of the effort in this space to think about how this can go wrong and how we can protect against those those risks because I think this is I this is not something to pursue lightly uh, and so here are a sample of a few of the things that could possibly go wrong but it's just a few of them and they're not fully explored uh, fat ta target for data theft fat target for disruption harming individuals risk of subpoena I the co-op could you know potentially act not according to the interests of its members or not according to the agreements with its members. I, there are interesting risks if the co-op isn't trusted by the data purchasers because the, do, data, the data purchasers are going to need 
to entrust the co-op in most scenarios with fairly sensitive data about what they're trying to achieve. Um, and they need to trust the data that they get from the co-op. The co-op could be taken over, could become evil, um, all sorts of things could go wrong in this space. Um, and so a huge, huge, huge research question is what are the tools of various sorts, technical tools, legal tools, uh, governance tools that you can put in place in order to mitigate risks, uh, put in, you know, an emergency stop button, whatever it is. What are the things that you can put in place in order to protect against all of these concerns? Yeah. Maybe one to add to the list is uh, how, how do you stop there being, I mean, all of these dangers are more acute when you have a very small number of these co-op style entities. Yes. However, that seems to be what's required to materialize the benefits of actual, you know, if you want people with clout and if you're arguing that the whole idea is to give people a collective. Yeah, yeah, so there's a, there's a very interesting sort of tension about um, how to structure the marketplace so that you have the right amount of competition and the right sort of benefits. Um, and yeah, and that's one of the questions that I think was asked later. Yeah. Um, Obviously, there are a lot of questions here. Um, and so I'll give a sample of a few of the spaces of questions. We have started to collect these questions, as you'll see. Um, but I want to hear more of them um, from all of you. So I, we have some sort of ground rules that we put in place um, for doing and work and thinking in this area. Basically, sort of openness, transparency kinds of themes. Um, Really important, but I have only a couple of minutes, so I'm going to, to jump ahead. Emphasis on uh, diversity of ideas, diversity of models, diversity of tools, and potentially diversity of co-ops. Um, thinking about sort of the benefits there. So there are lots of research areas that are relevant in this space. I'm going to save all of the markets and incentives questions for tomorrow, and I'll try to briefly talk about some of the other ones. Um, so. Questions like how much of the solution needs to be legal and how much of it needs to be technical and how does that depend on the particular uh, environment in which you choose to, to launch this. You know, if you launch this in the US versus in Israel versus in Europe, um, what needs to be changed? What are the mechanisms for change? Can you identify uh, ways in which uh, current practices with respect to data in, infringe individual rights? So can you use that as a tool? Um, sort of collecting a, an understanding of the relevant uh, enshrinements of rights and the, the relevant work that's been done in the legal space, I think is already a major task in this space. Um, and this is really just a, a brief sampling. I'll do it quickly. Um, I, in the space of regulation and governance, I mean, as some of this conversation has already alluded to, the, the governance structure of the co-op is going to be really important in helping it achieve its goals. Uh, so you have to think carefully about how is a co-op going to make it, its choices collectively? Um, what sort of legal entity should it, should it be? Um, there's an interesting uh, thing going on here where the, um, the co-op is potentially a big enough entity that it's straddling in this odd space where it's not really a self-regulating thing. It's potentially doing something that resembles things one might do with government regulation, but potentially not using government regulation. Um, and as I mentioned before, you need to put in sort of technical and legal safeguards to protect the data users and the analysts from the co-op, as well as protecting the, the members of the co-op. So how do you do all of this? What are the right tools in this space? How do you protect it from something, somebody bad uh, taking gain of the, of the data? Yes. Of the yes, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's one of the huge questions. Um, and then what are the launch strategies? Um, and I think this is, this is a, a really fun one to think about. Um, you know, do you focus on a particular type of data in terms of, you know, do you focus on medical data first? Do you focus on data that's currently not being collected and start collecting a new, you know, rich data set that's not available to anybody? Uh, do you think that this should launch in a particular country with a particular demographic, with a particular, you know, 
where, how, how many people do you need in order in, for this thing to actually be providing value on both sides? Um, how do you get to that point? What are the things that are going to stop you along the way? So huge number of questions. You know, should a co-op emerge from existing organizations? Pros and cons of it coming out of a hospital, out of a government, out of a you name it. Um, and then you know, risk, 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 and concerns, concerns, concerns. And then a big part of this is starting a conversation across the many disciplines that are relevant in this space. Um, so how do we come together to understand each other, to build something that involves tools from many different disciplines and solves a problem that we all care about? And lots of technical questions, privacy questions, security questions, HCI questions, I mean, huge questions. How do you get people to be able to express their preferences and, and understand what's going on with their data? We really don't know how to do this. Um, but lots of interesting questions. Formal verification would be potentially a huge player in this space. Um, and then I said I would save it all for, for tomorrow, and I basically will. Um, but there are lots of interesting economic questions, incentive questions, mechanism design questions in this space. Um, and some of the ones that we won't really get to tomorrow, so I'll just mention them now. Uh, how do you set and control the incentives of the organization as a whole? How should, should you think about managing privacy budgets for individuals and across time? How should you think about mission creep and how to control against it? How can we potentially use the, the co-op to detect and protect against data being used to manipulate people? Um, and I said, lots more coming in this space tomorrow. So I just wanted to say again, um, this is about bringing people together to figure out what the questions should be. Um, this is not a proposal to do something specific or build something specific. We don't have answers. We have some questions. We want more questions and then maybe some answers. Uh, so join us. I, we will be chatting probably briefly after the, the group meeting tomorrow, just to sort of have an initial organizational meeting for a few minutes. But if you can't make that and you're interested in co-ops, you can get in touch with me or Colby. Um, we'll be having a weekly meeting where we plan to do a combination of a reading group, bringing papers from all of these related areas together, um, and not just papers, but you know, sort of other readings. And, and then we plan to think of this as sort of a working group. We'd like, hopefully, for people to start peeling off pieces of this space that are interesting to them and working out you know, what are the questions that should be asked, what are the tensions, um, what are the related literatures um, potentially producing over the course of the semester, some research agendas, white papers, um, starting to, to identify what, what we can do in this space. And I think an important thing to keep in mind is even if you, I don't think we've got it you know, just right with what I've said here, there should be a question for you somewhere in this space, given that you're in this room. Um, and so I'd love to hear more about the, the connections, concerns, critiques, ideas that you have. And that's it for now. Thanks, guys.